Good evening. We will begin our presentation in two minutes. Good evening, my name is Dan Omdahl. I'm a public information officer on Northwest Team 10. Welcome, welcome to tonight's community meeting where we will be providing you an update on the Schneider Springs fire that's currently 104,800 acres and 31% contained. We'll also have a couple of individuals who will be providing uh, information on post-fire recovery and landowner assistance. Now, although virtual, this is a public meeting and we encourage your participation. And one way you can do that is by submitting questions and comments into the chat box. At the end of all of the presentations, as time permits, we will ask the presenters the questions that have been submitted onto Facebook. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, uh, all of the presenters will be introducing themselves, and to lead us off will be the incident meteorologist, giving us a forecast for the fire area. Good evening, everybody. Incident meteorologist trainee Rick Lujan here. So we finally made it. We made it to the day we've all been waiting for uh, eagerly through the summer. Uh, it's been hot and dry we're finally getting that weather pattern change that we've been expecting now for about a week. So on the west side of the fire, we're already seeing some precipitation fall this afternoon. We've received a few hundredths of an inch uh, near the bumping lake area. And that higher humidity that we're seeing on that side of the fire is moving east. We expect the next round of precipitation to start sometime around midnight along the west side of the fire, spreading east with time through the, the morning hours. Uh, this should be a good, steady rain, a very wetting rain for the fire. We're expecting anywhere from a half inch on the west side to maybe a quarter inch on the east side. But nonetheless, it's a, it's a good wetting rain, something this, uh, this area has not seen in a very long time. As we get through the weekend, we're expecting yet another round tomorrow evening into Sunday morning. Uh, so we could see another wedding rain with that. And then as we head into next week, it looks a little bit drier, um, but temperatures look to remain cool. So I will take questions after uh, we're done. Good evening, Forest Ombi, Fire Behavior Analyst. So, you know, the last couple days, we actually had some dry air, and the fire put a lot of smoke up, and that was because it did hit some fuels. It had the opportunity to burn, and it's kind of like a, a, a beast out there. It's hungry. It needs some food, and the food is the, the fuels out there, the timber, the grass, the brush, and all the litter out there on the ground from the forest itself. And it had an opportunity to chew through that and eat up a lot of that material. Uh, today we were expecting the rain to come and it's coming in a little bit later and when we get that precipitation it's going to actually take that food away from it and 
You know, I know the previous meeting that we had, I was asking a little bit of what would I want to talk to you guys about or what's the question you would have for me? And that was, you know, hey, when's this fire going to be over and out? Well, there's a couple different things. It's not necessarily going to be over and out, but the opportunities for it to really make any big spreads or, or runs is going to diminish, especially with this rain. It's going to take that food, the, the timber out there, away from it. It's going to make it wet. It's not going to want to run and run through that. The topography is there, the slopes. When it hits a slope, it does want to run up those types of slopes. But with the wet fuels, it's going to have a harder time to do that. So we're going to see a big time slowing of this fire. And whether it's the season ending event, we're still kind of short of that right now. If we get a lot of rain out of this system and we get cooler temperatures following behind it, then yes, it could be kind of a season ending event. But that doesn't mean the fire will be out because there's stump holes, there's logs, and the big things that are out there are going to continue to burn until they're fully consumed. And there's a large fire out here, so you can't have people running through the whole thing to put it out. So those will have to actually consume themselves for it to be totally out. So it's going to be out when snow flies. And as I kind of looked at it, I kind of thought of a turkey, you know, it's stick the fork in it and you test it. Well, it's not done yet. And we're going to have to wait a little bit for it to happen, which is going to be probably Thanksgiving when we see that snow fly for it to be out. And with that, I'll answer questions afterward. Good evening, Dean Lang Operations. So we'll start uh, in the black line area. So for those of you that don't know, the black line area on a fire is the stuff that's uh, well in control and control and contained. And you can see that much of this stuff on the uh, east side is in that status. So we call that the patrol status. We spend a lot of time back hauling equipment so that we can reuse it and get it off the line. Down here around a burnt mountain, we've got a, a fire use team down there. Uh, we're going to pull those guys back as uh, this weather comes in. Uh, but they've been down here monitoring this piece in here. Uh, you might recall originally we were going to go over towards Shellback, but we decided to hold back on that. This piece over here on the west is all in the wilderness. Uh, you might notice that uh, we added about 2,000 acres burned in the last couple of days. That's because the humidity has dropped, the inversion lifted, and uh, this stuff in here is all just being monitored. A lot of that growth was down in here. Uh, it, was, it did what we expected it to do. So uh, moving over towards Bumping Lake, uh, the structure protection stuff is in place. There's dozer lines in place, some very good protection there for those folks. Um, up in Goose Prairie, uh, the same thing. We've got hose lays, we've got sprinklers, uh, we've got good protection in there. A uh, lot of work, a lot of work in there, a lot of work talking to the, the residents, uh, explaining what's going on. As you can see, the fire has kind of uh, bumped the, the river and the road. Um, it's all what we wanted to do. We wanted to get uh, to a containment spot. It's in an area that we think we can control. So we like where we're at there. This pooch right here is, uh, is up on top of American Ridge. It did grow, this piece up here did grow uh, some overnight and yesterday, uh, still within uh, where we want it to be. But one thing that did happen today was with the winds, we've got this front moving in. And so uh, with the winds and the humidity, we did get some growth down in this area right here. It did spot a little bit uh, down there. Uh, we did shift crews that were working on some line here to, to beef that up. Uh, it, it's not trying to burn real hard. Humidities are going up. Uh, so uh, we like where we're at there too. So uh, that's where the night shift is gonna be primarily working. Up in uh, what we're calling Delta in hotel, uh, you're familiar with uh, the lines that we've been putting in, trying to cut this thing off. Uh, if you've been uh, paying attention to our briefings and stuff a whole lot, we've been really working on a line from DP40 to DP26. It's been an exercise in patience, um, experience, and flexibility because every time we get the humidity is just right to burn, then we got a wind problem or vice versa. So for two or three days, uh, People have been in there trying to get this thing done, couldn't get it done last night. Everything lined up and uh, they really did it. They, they ran all the way down to the river. We're 75 to 300 feet deep right there. We like what we got going on right there. So uh, the repair group, uh, their job is to get in there and repair damages done by the fire. 
Uh, we've got a local uh, fella in there, John Campbell. Been a great stroke for us to have. Uh, really has got good local knowledge. He's working hand in hand with the FMO and we're repairing all that stuff for the prioritized list so that we can make sure that things like rec your winter recreation and things like that uh, can go off without a hitch. Um, I mentioned our night shift. Uh, man, I can't say enough about our night shift. The night shift and day shift uh, collaboration has been fantastic. Uh, one takes off right where the other one left off. In fact, a, a little story on flexibility. Tonight was going to be a half shift for the night shift, and then we were going to rotate those folks into daytime other than a, a strike team and a division. Uh, just before the briefing with this stuff up here uh, being a little bit of a concern, we decided to ask to get these guys to work the full night shift instead of a half a night shift and uh, to a person everybody was in they were eager and uh, that's what you got fighting for you so you, you couldn't ask for much more uh, we did close this road here uh, the bumping road uh, just because last time we had fire near the road we had all kinds of trees coming down and so forth uh, our crews are working with the folks in goose prairie and, and that live around there so that they're educated and know what's going on there so uh, with that I'll be around to ask questions uh, later. Good evening. Tony Miller with Yakima Valley Emergency Management. Tonight I'm just going to do a little bit of recap on the evacuations and what's to come. So as we know, Bumping River Road is closed right now, but we still are in a level two there for the private homeowners. So. The team's working with them if they need to get in and out, but we're hoping they can stay until we get that road back in check. Um, then we come back around. We are still in level two, down through the uh, Cliffdale, down the Pine Cliff area. Only reason we're doing that, you've seen the fire behavior has been kind of crazy. We just want to make sure that's all good before we start lowering any more of these evacuation levels. Um, from Pine Cliff all the way around Highway 12, that's still level one. We're hoping on. Um, after this weather system comes through that we can uh, reevaluate that and hopefully drop some of the evacuation levels completely and lower the others. Um, also, 104,000 acres and we've not lost any structures in this, so great job to our team and the crews. I'll be around for questions afterwards. Uh, good evening, I'm Aaron Stockton, the district ranger here on the Natchez uh, Ranger District. Uh, first off, I just want to say thank you uh, to Team 10, Pacific Northwest Team 10. Uh, today marks their halfway point. Um, we've been really uh, happy to work with them on this assignment. They're doing a great job. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about forest closure, where we still get a lot of questions about that with hunting season uh, upon us um, and, and what is available for access and what's not. So first, I'd like to just point out the current boundary of our closure. I know that it's, it's difficult to see this map, so I'll try to, to, to verbally describe it as well. So our current closure uh, closes everything from Highway 410 to the west to the Pacific Crest Trail, but not including the Pacific Crest Trail, so travel along the trail is still allowed. Um, and then everything south of 410 down to Highway 12, so kind of that core central area um, that surrounds the, the fire perimeter. Um, and is bound by those uh, highways. What is open then is everything north and east of 410 to include the Little Natchez area uh, up on um, uh, Manastash Ridge, Moon Rocks, Funny Rocks, all of that area, and then everything south of Highway 12 um, all the way down to Conrad Meadows, so the Rim Rock area and, and area south. Uh, kind of what we're looking at in the future here, uh, everything's really dependent on this weather that's coming through this weekend. We're hoping to um, open areas that are outside of the fire perimeter. Uh, once again, that, that, that depends on the weather that we're getting. Um, what I can tell you for uh, uh, fairly certain um, is that do not expect access into areas that are within this red perimeter until we get snowfall and enough snow that we can get in and groom those areas. So that snow helps mitigate a lot of those hazard trees along those roadways. Um, it was mentioned earlier that we're doing uh, repair, and so that's uh, suppression repair, which is different than our bear activities. Our suppression repair, we get in and try to mitigate um, you know, those hazard trees, try to repair roads that were damaged in, in the uh, suppression activities. 
um, you know, pull back in on the, the uh, bulldozer lines and stuff like that. So um, we still have a lot of activity once the fire is out within that perimeter um, using a lot of heavy equipment, um, uh, trucks, uh, log trucks. We have to pull out a lot of those logs that were cut along the, um, uh, the, the fire lines and stuff like that. So um, do not expect access into the actual red uh, perimeter um, until, until snowfall and enough snow that we can get in there and groom those routes. Um, but what we are trying to do is get access, like I said, depending on this event, um, to those areas like Oak Creek, um, the rest of the wilderness areas, and in the bumping reservoir area after uh, we can get in there and mitigate a lot of those hazard trees as were mentioned earlier. So I'll be around uh, for any questions. Um, thanks. Hey, good evening, folks. My name is Lee Ellis, uh, special uses desk here at the Natchez Ranger Station. Just want to take some time and talk about uh, applicable to individuals and families in our large cabin community here in the district that have recreation residence permits through the Forest Service. Just some tips that you all can do to help defend your structure and help make it a little bit easier for responders as they assess your structure, begin work. Uh, required by the permit, you are, when we do ask and you are required, uh, to keep your immediate vicinity of your cabin out to 10 feet around, free of dead grasses, dead shrubs, uh, keep those needles and duffs off your deck and roofs. And then beyond that, we allow cabin uh, permittees to fell any trees less than 20 feet, dead trees, and on their cabin lot. Any actions off that cabin lot have to be approved through the Ranger District, as well as any actions on live trees greater than 20 feet. Uh, if you want any more information about that, feel free to reach out to the Ranger District, reach out to myself. Uh, after approval, there's some certain mitigation specifications we can help you work through to make sure that your lots remain open for access and fuel free. And uh, again, I'll be around after for any questions. I did take a look through the Facebook uh, attendees and saw a lot of our cabin community out there. So thank you folks for attending. Right. Good, good evening. My name is Ryan Anderson, and I work for the Washington Resource Conservation and Development Council. Uh, I was asked to come out here tonight and talk a little bit about uh, the processes and some resources that are available for the community in the post-fire uh, you know, post world. So I'm real grateful for the team for getting us this close to the post-fire world and looking forward to the, to the recovery phase. Uh, one, one thing to expect in, in the burnt area once, once it's safe to do so, uh, the burnt area emergency response team, uh, you know, if it's safe to go in there, they'll evaluate, that, that's a federal team of multidisciplinary uh, experts, they'll evaluate the burn severity and, um, and they'll look at what that burn severity means to risks of, of things of value in the burned area and downstream of that burned area. So they'll be looking for, for what are the, what's the hazard uh, level and expectation on debris flows and post-fire flooding. So they'll be, and they'll be working with, with you know, meteorologists and things like that to, to give everybody a heads up about that. If you're a private landowner and, and you've been impacted by, by the wildfire, there's resources available locally to, to you know, come out and have a look and, um, and, and make some recommendations of programming that you might be eligible for for some recovery on your own land. I recommend contacting the North Yakima Conservation District and I provided the, the team here with their contact information to, to, to put in the comments tonight. Um, and you could give them a call if you got some private land that's been damaged, they'll do an assessment and see if you uh, are eligible for some assistance. You can, you can also work with the local DNR landowner assistance program uh, if you got some, some treatment you want to do on your land. They'll, they'll talk you through that as well. Uh, for, for, for private residents and, and cabin owners that are going back home once it's safe um, after they've been evacuated or you're returning home after a fire, there's a, there's a great resources that we've posted on one of our websites on fireadaptedwashington.org. And I, and I provided a link to this resource too. It's a, re it's a resource for residents and, and cabin owners going back into the fire. It gives you lots of things to think about that you might want to bring with you when you go in to keep yourself and your family safe. Things to be aware of like hazard trees um, and post-fire flooding. And, and it, it's a very comprehensive resource. I highly recommend everyone check out. 
Um, and, and again, if you're, if you're in this fire area and, and you've, you've signed up for the emergency alerts through, um, through the Yakima County Emergency Management, that's great. If you haven't done that, um, this post-fire environment uh, is an environment where you want to maintain your situational awareness and signing up for those alerts uh, just in case there's, there's more disturbance like, like you know, heavy rainfall and a flood. Uh, it's a really good idea to, to be aware of those alerts. So I, I put all these links, um, or I've asked the, the team here to put all these links in the comments and the contacts that I talked about in the comments, and I'll be available for questions uh, later on. Thanks. Uh, good Friday evening, everyone. I'm Seth Jones, the District Manager for Fire and Forest Health with the Department of Natural Resources uh, here in Yakima. I uh, just wanted to start out by saying uh, thanks to all of our partners that we've had along the way throughout this incident. Uh, you know, that'd be the Forest Service, the Nile Cliffdale Fire Department, <clears throat> uh, Natchez Department, Fire Department and uh, especially the Northwest Team 10, Al Lawson and his team, um, and the great work that all of their firefighters have been doing uh, out on the on on the line. Uh, we also want to thank you, uh, say thanks to all the community and their support that we've had along the way. Uh, that support really goes a long way for the firefighters who are out there uh, day in and day out doing the work uh, to get this fire put out as quickly as possible. Um, a couple of points I wanted to make tonight. Uh, DNR did open its lands. Uh, re they recently announced that we opened our lands east of the Cascades. Um, there is an exception uh, to that. Uh, it's similar to um, the Forest Service that there is still a, a fire closure um, for our lands that are between uh, Highway 410 and Highway 12 down here. So those DNR lands are still closed to the public, but everything outside of that is open. Um, we do expect to see an increased amount of traffic, uh, public use out on the uh, out on the open lands that we have. Um, and we just want to remind everyone to recreate responsibly um, with the amount of traffic that we'll have and the little bit of rain that's forecasted, uh, making sure that we're driving safe on those roads uh, um, for they may be slippery or hazardous. Um, there also is still a DNR burn ban in effect uh, through the end of the month. So uh, our lands are still closed for, or the, the campfires are still closed on those lands. Um, the last point I wanted to talk about was our uh, landowner assistance program. Um, that is a 50 50 uh, grant funded cost share program open to the private landowners. Uh, for your properties. So whether you had a uh, property that was directly impacted by the fire or if you want to uh, reduce some of the fuels uh, on your lands uh, that were not impacted, uh, we have a program set up for that. And really what that does, that helps you, the landowner, uh, uh, get reimbursed for the, the fuels reduction work on your property or it goes towards a contractor that could come in and perform that work for you. Uh, and, and what we mean by fuels reduction is thinning those trees out, uh, limbing those up, uh, brushing, removing brush, and all the slash disposal that comes along with uh, that kind of work. Uh, so we do have uh, a landowner assistance forester for your area. Uh, you can contact her. her uh, info should be in the chat uh, or you can call our regional office in Ellensburg at 509-925-8510. Again, thank you. Uh, hello and good evening, everyone. Al Lawson, Incident Commander, Northwest Team 10. Uh, first off, I want to get a shout out to our public information section for helping put this on. There's a lot of folks behind the scenes that to help make this happen, and so thank, thanks to our PIO shop. Uh, first off, uh, I went up on the fire line a couple of days ago, and it, I didn't go without notice. Um, the, the cooperation and uh, the work that's being done up there. I met with uh, several folks from different agencies, and uh, what, I, what I found is that the relationships uh, that I'm seeing have been built long term. 
Uh, the folks that are here um, are easy to work with. Uh, it's been an easy transition because of those relationships that have built over time. So uh, hats off to, to all the agencies we work with uh, and our partners. Uh, great job on that. Um, secondly, it goes without saying, I want to thank the firefighters that have been out there on the line. We have uh, uh, right around 600 folks uh, that have been out there diligent doing all the work that Dean pointed out here both night and day, um, making sure that folks are safe. And to their credit, we've had zero accidents, which, which is really good considering um, the hazards we have out there and what folks are exposed to. Some of that ground out there is treacherous, um, but those folks have been fighting through that and putting in some good solid line and getting work done. And lastly, you know, our whole goal with Team 10 is to, to uh, bring back normalcy to the community. Um, the community members out there have been impacted by multiple months of fire in the landscape. Multiple teams have come in and work on this. And literally, they passed the torch along to us. And we recognize the work that those teams have done ahead of us, uh, the work from the other agencies out there, the fire departments, uh, et cetera. And uh, we're just carrying this on through and try, trying to get it out to the end. And hopefully, we have a season ending event here that soon we'll really really put this thing to rest but again uh thank you for taking time to join us tonight uh i'm excited to, to be here and anxious to hear uh, some of some of the questions you may have for us again thank you thank you uh that concludes our formal presentation but it does appear that we have a few questions that ended up in our chat box and the first group of questions will be directed to the operations chief dean lang How close to the river has the fire gotten to the Natchez River in Cliffdale? My family has a cabin on the east side, uh, same track as Whistling Jackson. What does the fire activity on the west side of the river coming down from Edgar Rock look like? Okay, so that question is referring to this, this piece here that I refer to as the, the drop point 40 to 26 piece. It is down um, to the toe of the slope. It is around the cabins. Um, it's, it's all around there. Um, we have we have crews in there. We've got hose lines in there. Uh, we've burned out around a couple of the structures. Um, I, I'm feeling really good about the fire situation. Uh, the one piece that I'm a little bit worried about is with all this rain that's coming, uh, loose rocks, trees, and things like that. But the fire is down to the cabins. It's it's right there. Fire is just across the river at Cliffdale. Is the fire staying at the ground level or is it getting up and torching into the trees? So good question. So uh, it did get up into the trees a couple of times uh, today. We had uh, with this front moving, we had we had winds that would go from the southeast uh, one minute and 10 minutes later be coming from the northwest. So it did get into some trees. Uh, we didn't uh, we didn't lose any ground, so to speak. Uh, we didn't lose any structures. Um, you know, it, it, it's doing what fire does. It, it, it rolls out, it makes runs, um, but the, our primary uh, focus is always on life safety and the cabins and so forth. So if we lose a few trees, uh, we can live with that. If we, li if we lose some cabins, that's a whole other story. Uh, question, any structure loss so far? Uh, no. Uh, what is the end game for the cabins below American Ridge on 410? So. Long term, on this piece right here, that's what they're referring to, is that the, the control line is the, is the highway there. So we've got plans in place to keep it from crossing the highway. When we, uh, when, if this thing gets down there and around cabins, we'll do the exact same thing we did at Cliffdale. We'll get our, our folks in place. We'll make sure that the structural protection things are, are ready to go, hose lines, uh, sprinklers on roofs, all those kinds of things. And if things get really, really dicey, uh, we typically, like we did in Cliffdale a couple of nights ago, we'll put a fire truck at each at each resident if that's what we need to do. So we'll do whatever we got to do to protect the cabins. Looks like we have a few uh, questions for Forest Service and Aaron. Uh, the question is, will cabin owners be able to access our cabin in the closed area before snow? 
So that is uh, my hopes. Um, and so we're just waiting to see what happens through this weekend with the weather, with the rain. Uh, hopefully it puts enough uh, uh, moisture on it to, to really put it at bay. As was mentioned earlier, um, you know, along Bumping Road, we did have active fire immediately adjacent to the road today. So they had to stop all traffic uh, in and out of the road. Um, so there'll be some issues to deal with that with hazard trees uh, even after that's over. But it, it is a priority for me to in uh, suppression repair to take care of those areas to allow folks to get into uh, into those cabins to winterize. So um, we'll watch it through the weekend, see what the weather does, and and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to allow that access. It says, can you have a campfire after September 17th on the National Forest? So uh, that's something I wanted to mention earlier. We did go into, um, uh, we downgraded our uh, fire restrictions. We're now in a level one, which allows for campfires in uh, developed campgrounds only. Um, and so that's uh, Forest Service developed camp campgrounds that have the Forest Service fire rings. You can currently have uh, campfires in those locations. We don't have a lot of campgrounds uh, that are open now on this district, on the Natchez district. Most of our developed campgrounds um, close after Labor Day. Um, but we're waiting to see how the, the weather, and this is forest-wide, Okanagan, Wenatchee, we're waiting to see because not only are we getting rain, but the other districts are forecast to get rain. And we're hoping, uh, depending on, on what the weather does, that, that by next weekend we'll be able to lift those restrictions across the forest and allow campfires. But for now, we're still in uh, restriction level one, which is uh, campfires only in developed camp rings. And even if you're in that situation, we still ask you to be careful. Um, you know, make sure that you're not leaving any of those campfires uh, abandoned and uh, we don't want to have any more incidents between now and season ending event. Thank you, Aaron. That uh, concludes the formal presentation. I see that there are no more questions uh, in the chat box. However, if you do have some questions and they tend to flow in there, uh, we have folks that will be answering those questions online. Um, also, if you're continue to uh, remain interested in the fire, we post daily updates on NCWeb and Facebook. We have an email address and a phone number that you can contact us by phone or through email. Those addresses are long and hard to remember, but there will be a page at the end, not only with our contact information, but also with some of the resources that were mentioned earlier in the program. And so with that, I'd like to thank all of those who were able to participate this evening. Thank you all who were able to uh, attend and to our speakers who so graciously afforded us their time. And to all, good night. <laughs>